Good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you all for joining us today. Today, we will be discussing the global financial system in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, we will discuss how the system has performed, some of the strengths and weaknesses, and some of the reforms necessary to prepare for and respond to future crises. Uh, I can think of no better experts to discuss this subject than our featured speakers today. Uh, so before I turn it over to them, just a couple of quick notes from me. Um, as always, we will reserve time at the end for audience Q&A. If you have a question, please submit it by sending it in through the Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar. You can also send it in through the chat function, and we'll collect these questions throughout. And then when it's time for Q&A, we will call on individuals, and you can pose your questions to the speakers. So now let me briefly introduce our speakers before I turn it over to them. Um, we're delighted today to have our featured guest, Dr. Carmen Reinhardt, with us, who is the Vice President and Chief Economist at the World Bank Group. Um, her thought leadership over the past year has been essential as the bank has navigated the coronavirus crisis. Um, as many of you know, she has spent a large part of her career studying and analyzing financial crises and has published extensively on this topic. Uh, so we're very fortunate to hear her thoughts today. Uh, she is also currently on public service leave from the Harvard Kennedy School. So thank you very much for joining us today, Carmen. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. And moderating today's conversation is our very own uh, Bill Dudley, chairman of our Bretton Woods Committee Board. Um, and as many of you know, Bill became president of the Federal Reserve Bank uh, um, um, of New York amidst the, the global financial crisis. So he is very well positioned and experienced to discuss this subject as well and to moderate this conversation. Um, and of course, uh, Bill has been instrumental. His leadership has been instrumental in guiding the vision of the Bretton Woods Committee. We have a very bright future ahead of us. Um, and that is in large part thanks to Bill's leadership. So thank you, Bill, and I will turn it over to you to kick off our conversation. Well, thank you, Emily, and thank you so much, Karen, for doing this. Uh, Karen and I have worked together in the past. Karen was on the advisory panel at the New York Fed, so we've had many conversations about financial stability, financial instability, and her expertise uh, is extraordinarily uh, welcome here. What, what, what I do to start is I'm gonna turn the floor over to, to Carmen to make some uh, introductory remarks and then we'll uh, have a uh, sort of fireside chat and I'll ask her some questions and then we'll open up it to the audience at the end. So Carmen, let me turn it over to you. So thank you, Bill. And indeed, I, I you know, have very fond memories of, of our, our discussions and, at the New York Fed uh, uh, advisory. Um, you know, where to begin? I, I think what I'd like to do is sort of lay out a variety of issues relating to the global financial architecture and what I see as the major post-COVID financial challenges or challenges in that dimension. Because if I speak on the issue of challenges more broadly, I think it, it would be so diffuse and so interminable. You know, uh, I, I, I do have to mention that to me, one of the most striking, most striking things of the pandemic uh, has been twofold. One is how regressive it's been. We, we were having a conversation on this just, just before this, that it's been, you know, very unequal shock hitting low-income households in smaller firms within country, and then creating, you know, a bigger gap between rich and poor countries, and you know, middle-income countries like the middle class in many, many countries being particularly hard hit. Also, uh, so so it's been a very very unequal uh, crisis. And that actually will feed into our discussion on uh, implications for the financial architecture. Um, the second point that I wanted to highlight that's more broad than finance is simply, it, it's been a setback um, of, you know, decades of progress, it, it, you know, when you look at um, poverty, global poverty rates, it, you know, the, the 2020 marks the first pop in international, internationally measured poverty rates since the late 1990s. So it's, it's, it's 
set back um, and, and that will have lasting consequences that feeds into the issues that we're gonna focus on on, on on the financial side. But let me start on the, some of bigger issues on the financial side and really just to lay out more in terms of laying out uh, some of the topics that I, I think um, you know, are, are critical and um, that, that uh, rather than you know, offer any kind of complete picture or discussion, we can leave that for later. But so one of the areas I think COVID legacy has to do precisely with some of the inequality issues that I raised earlier, uh, the impact of the pandemic coming on top of what were very weak initial conditions has really left a lot of low-income countries uh, either at debt distress or near debt distress, at a high risk of debt distress. In effect, if you look at the uh, uh, 73, 74, depending on whether you include Angola, countries that are eligible for the DSSI, uh, for the debt suspension, uh, debt service suspension initiative, uh, more than half of those countries are already in debt distress or are rated in a, in a zero to four risk scale at, 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 at three, which is just below being already in debt distress. At, at, and so um, the COVID pandemic isn't entirely responsible for that. As I said, initial conditions in many of those countries were had already deteriorated markedly pre-pandemic. Uh, you know, they many of these countries had seen a surge in borrowing. These are low-income countries that had benefited from the HIPIC initiative, the highly indebted poorest country initiatives, which had a lot of debt write-offs. Um, so they had started out with a clean balance sheet, but a lot of new borrowing also borrowing from China uh, at a time when commodity prices were high. Um, you know, the combination of having a relatively clean balance sheet and high commodity prices made them very attractive. And also many of them tapped uh, private capital markets as well, issuing bonds, issuing Euro bonds for the first time. Uh, I'm bringing these issues up because they're the legacy of what we're gonna have to face in, and so during this bonanza period in which commodity prices were high, many of these countries were growing very rapidly, uh, debt was not a concern, debt was quickly built up. Uh, and so when commodity prices fell in 2015 and they, they didn't just fall, they really cracked, uh, it exposed a lot of problems, growth slowed down and so, enter the COVID pandemic already with many in weak fundamentals. So uh, one challenge I think that the financial architecture uh, going forward has to address are some issues that are reminiscent but not exact to the 1980s. Uh, you know, the Look, I don't need to tell you, Bill, you were at the very heart of it, but you know, the, the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009 is called global, but it was really more an advanced economy. You know, it was about a dozen wealthy advanced economies that had had, you know, asset price bubbles and financial excesses. Um, so the last time we had a real concerted developing country problem like this wasn't 2008, 2009, it was the 1980s. Uh, and, and I would say that this doesn't have, of course, the drama of the 80s in that, you know, this significant spike in US interest rates as the Federal Reserve tried to rein in inflation Act, you know, acted as a, 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 a coordinating device and you've got a, you know, a domino effect. Of, we don't have that kind of drama now, but what we have uh, 
is, is you know, uh, a long list of countries with already, especially among the poorer countries with debt problems and a much longer list that of, of sovereigns that are also emerging market sovereigns that are also at risk. They're not flashing right now, but so there's the immediate or pre-existing problem and how to deal with that, um, the debt ser service suspension initiative will come to an end this December. And so the, it becomes clear that in many of these countries, debt temporary debt suspension was a welcome, uh, you know, uh, relief valve, if you will, to uh, enable them to spend where it was most needed to cope with the effects of the pandemic. But it doesn't solve, you know, temporary, uh, you know, a temporary moratoria does not solve your debt sustainability issues. And so that is now fallen in the arms of the G20 in the context of the common framework, which we can discuss, you know, later. And the common framework, uh, what it has done uh, is in a sense replace the role that the Paris Club played in earlier uh, in earlier crises by importantly incorporating non-Paris Club members, which are critical creditors like China, like India, Saudi Arabia, um, and so um, you know there is. I just I'm, I'm just setting the stage for what. Uh, I think we we can uh, follow up on. Uh, there is the sovereign financial fragility concerns. There's a second set of concerns, and I'll be very brief to highlight these, which are much broader. And these encompass not just low-income countries, but a lot of middle-income countries and some high-income countries as well, which has to do with financial frailties. Um, you know, ab about more than a year ago, I did a piece in Project Syndicate called, This Time Truly Is Different. And, you know, um, it highlights, well, you know, this started as a health emergency, a health crisis. It did not start with financial excesses and so on. Um, but, it will morph into one the more persistent it is. And I think there, you know, the issue of persistence, um, you know, leaves more households vulnerable, leaves more firms vulnerable. And, you know, a lot of the headlines, and I'll conclude with this, a lot of the headlines uh, in the past year and a half have been about the massive fiscal policy response, the you know uh, aggressive monetary policy response, and much less said about a very aggressive, massive, and encompassing tried by many countries financial sector response in terms of forbearance. Uh, you know, firms and households being able to delay debt repayment, um, and. You know, I, I am concerned as these forbearance uh, measures begin to be clawed back or discontinued, um, who will emerge as illiquid and who will emerge as insolvent uh, is a big question mark because this, this crisis has had a lot of real side effects. So I think we're going to face financial challenges, not the 2008, 2009 variety. I'm not actually, you know, I, and this is not uniform to every country, but in varying degrees, I think, uh, you know, banks balance sheets are going to be, you know, a lot more affected than what we've seen thus far. And I think that that, that is 
what I call the quieter financial crisis because you know right now it's sort of in a back burner to to more to to the greater drama that we've seen so let me stop there so let me ask you a question about uh, interest rates because obviously you're you know i think you're absolutely right that the the forbearance is just forbearance it's not like you're forgiving the 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 debt service payments you're just postponing when they're when they're due how does the fed fit into all this with the fed following a very accommodative monetary policy regime uh, which is going to end at some point. And how, how much, how worried are you about, you know, a taper tantrum, uh, you know, when the Fed starts to pull back from what's an ex- really an exceptional monetary policy regime of stimulus right now? So, Bill, I, I think, you know, the, the, what you've asked is, is like really central. Uh, you know, uh, ages ago, I hate to think how long it was, one of my first uh, academic papers that, you know, received a bit of attention was precisely on external factors, namely how U.S. interest rates and the cycle in U.S. interest rates uh, affects capital flows to emerging markets and financial risk more broadly in emerging markets uh, and developing countries. Uh, so, first of all, Back paneling to last year, I think the Fed response uh, made a critical difference uh, in this not being, for many countries, a replay of the 1930s. I'm not being melodramatic when I say that. If you look in April, early May of last year, uh, the reversal in capital flows I actually track these things and have long long historic time series. You really have to go back to 1930. In in 30, 31, you see that kind of like draconian reversal. And in in effect, in six weeks, we had a sudden stop, uh, a reversal in in capital flows to EMs that took in, during the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009, took over a year to play out. So it was, it was very draconian and, you know, the very aggressive, the, not, not just the reduction in interest rate, but the whole creation of all the facilities and, and, and you know, uh, the uh, ample uh, provision of global liquidity. Uh, was was critical because look you know it, it, and we discussed this I think in one of our our sessions in or one of our lunches in in our New York days uh, the uh, the last shoe to drop in generating a default wave uh, is you know well let me well there's three shoes that should drop uh, for a default wave or usually do. One is a crash in commodity prices. The other is a reversal in capital flows and the other is a rise in US or international UK in the 19th century interest rates. Um, in, in April of last year, we had two out of the three. We had, remember oil prices in single digits, uh, massive reversal in capital flows. So. The only shoe that didn't drop was was the rise in U.S. rates, and I am concerned that that will drop at some point, and it will drop at a time in which initial conditions are a lot weaker. So I, uh, you know, um, I think the plus side. It's not all, you know, dark and gloom. The plus side is with a strong U.S. recovery with China's recovery, commodity prices have also revived, which is enormously uh, uh, important for many emerging markets, although there are, of course, commodity importers, you know, developing commodity importers are at a great disadvantage. But for the large swath of countries that are commodity exporters, this is a big plus. Um, you know, there's the plus of strong aggregate demand from the two largest economies. However, the the concern that 
uh, many countries, and I'm talking about large emerging markets, you know, countries that are, you know, Brazil, India, Turkey, South Africa, um, you know, the, the, there, is, there are a lot of vulnerabilities and uh, certainly if they're vulnerable at these kinds of international interest rates, uh, you, you, you know, you can sense of, of, of what uh, a, a, rate, uh, a rate hike, even not a draconian one as in the 80s uh, means. So, these are also, by the way, Bill, things interact because some of these uh, middle income countries are also where there are some of these internal fragility risks that I talked about, you know, earlier, you know, the, the, the financial forbearance coming to an end. Uh, I mean, look, credit growth is, is a big incentive. Uh, for recovery, it's a big engine of recovery, and I'm I'm concerned that uh, between internal problems and tightening external liquidity conditions, uh, that will be you know a big headwind. Uh, I mean, part part of the problem is that the the U.S. is going to be ahead of all these emerging market economies because Indeed. of the rollout of the vaccination has been also very uneven. So. If the U.S. is going to get to a place where they want to start to tighten sooner okay. than what's going to be appropriate for other places. And, and, and Bill, you know, uh, so, so there's, you know, two parts to this, um, you know, and you're absolutely right. I mean, one has to look at the, uh, uh, you know, incidents of COVID and you know, in the states, well, we're, we're we're seeing this really dramatic reduction. But and it's not just you know the headline India, but you know, in, in Brazil, it's not getting the daily headlines, but it's raging and it's raging in Brazil and in Colombia and in Argentina and so South America, Malaysia on a per capita basis is actually doing worse than India uh, in terms of infections rates. Uh, it, it's, you know, there are big swaths of the emerging world that, that are uh, on a more, much more delayed, much more damaging cycle. And, um, I, you know, I think the concern is not just, not just about whether the Fed or when the Fed tightens, but also if the market tightens for them. Right, you know, so it, with the prospect of overheating, as we know, you know, the, the discussion on potential increases in inflation, whether they're temporary or, or, or more, of a, a more lasting nature are very real. So, you know, even if the Federal Reserve does not, uh, uh, begin to taper very soon. Uh, inflation conditions may impact longer maturities with the same kinds of uh, implications for for a lot of the uh, you know debt that is priced off those rates. Yep, I agree with that. I'm going to switch gears and uh, ask you a, a bit about the financial crises and uh, the changes. You know, so we made a lot of changes to the regulatory and supervisory architecture uh, after the great financial crisis. And I think it did make the system more resilient to the COVID-19 shock. So how, how you assess what, what's been done and how you assess what still needs to be done? You know, there, what shortcomings have there been in terms of making the global financial system, you know, more secure going forward? So, so uh, first of all, you know, I I highlighted that I'm I'm concerned about financial fragility, but that that's a blanket statement, which applies very unevenly. 
uh, across countries. I think banks went into the pandemic really exceptional, solid condition, you know, and, and part of that is, is the legacy of, of, of the changes that were made. Um, you know, if you looked at U.S. bank, most metrics going into the pandemic were, you know, very, very solid. So I, I that's not where I have concern. I mean, and I'm going to divide my concerns between also the U.S., uh, and then contrast that with some of the EMs, uh, emerging markets and, and some of the developing countries. If, on the US side, I, I, I don't think it's, you know, uh, it, it has the shades of 2008, 2009. I'll tell you one thing that concerns me uh, is, you know, in a low for long environment, we all know that the search for yield is, is sort of the siren song, the eternal siren song. And um, the amount of, you know, when you look at corporate debt issuance, the amount that is, is, is uh, below investment grade or, you know, one wants to be polite and not use junk bond, but, you know, and with really weak covenants, weak covenants, so, so, you know, uh, there, I, I think one should not underestimate uh, more broadly in, in, in the financial uh, um, system. It's not, it's not a banking issue. It's not, you know, but I think on the corporate side that, you know, there, there's, that 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 I would say is, and and the corporate. Uh, by the way, you know, concerns about corporate fragility uh, and corporate debt issues are also alive and well in China. So you're you know you're talking about the two largest economies in the world having you know some corporate debt challenges uh, in terms of of of, of the the not just the level, but the quality, uh, which has been skewed in recent years to, to, to the higher risk end. Um, now that's not, first of all, most other countries, even advanced economies, very wealthy economies in Europe are much more bank dependent. Uh, so, you know, the capital market issues that I've raised are less applicable, certainly in the emerging markets, although in some countries, you know, importantly, Turkey, but, you know, uh, there are other countries as well that, you know, corporate debt is also, uh, is also problematic. I think the bigger concerns, Bill, and, and you asked about regu regulatory and, and in, indeed financial oversight is that I mentioned that there's been so many setbacks, um, you know, during COVID. And that's one area where I think there's setbacks. You know, after the Asian crisis, um, it, you know, the idea that emerging markets needed to move to more ball type, uh, you know, much more standardized, internationally comparable, uh, more transparent financial sector balance sheets. And that, that process got underway, which really led to much more hom homogeneity in balance sheets. You could read a balance sheet and you can know, okay, this is a non-performing loan. And COVID has really made a, a big setback on that because right now, figuring out what a non-performing loan is, is, is easier said than done because precisely these forbearance measures have applied not only differently across countries, but often across institutions within country. So what is being classified as a non-performing loan? What are, how, how are we measuring the various financial ratios has been in terms of homogeneity and transparency and all the things where we had made a lot of progress. I think that's an area that, 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 
we will have to work very hard at the international level to again start getting into uh, you know greater homogeneity because I, my sense right now, and this is a gross you know overstatement in terms of not uniformly applying to, but there's a big tendency to underestimate uh, the extent of non -P, you know NPLs because um, they're in forbearance. It also sounds like that there's a lot of increase in uncertainty, which also creates more risk because if people don't know what the financial condition is, you know, when they're optimistic, that's not a problem. But if they turn pessimistic, that sort of exacerbates the, the shock a bit. Absolutely, absolutely. When I mentioned that I was concerned that, uh, you know, um, a dearth of credit could be uh, a headwind, a significant headwind in, in many countries. It's precisely, it's a combination of what we've been talking about, what you said about uncertainty is you, and in, including uncertainty also about whether you're dealing with uh, a potential case of illiquidity or insolvency. I mean, right now, the uncertainty, you're trying to make a judgment whether you want to roll over debt for a, uh, uh, a business that's relating to, to the hospitality and tourism industry. What judgment do you apply? Are they going to recover fully? Are they going to recover partially? What is the timing of that recovery? And, and, and that is, is, you know, compounded by uh, another factor we haven't touched on, although we kind of touched on it more obliquely, which is, you know, during COVID, uh, pretty much across the board, whether ranging from low income to high income, we've seen big surges in public debt. Uh, and in particularly uh, middle to low income countries where, you know, I mean, the US treasury debt gets bought globally. Uh, the, an emerging market or certainly a low income countries some of them enjoy global interest, but most really are local buyers, which means the banks. Uh, so the, the you know, infamous doom loop that was so discussed after, the, especially in Europe after the 2008-2009 crisis, where domestic banks are now sitting on a very large stock of government debt, and those governments are getting downgraded. Uh, you know, so there's the more classic crowding out issues that are there, but then there's also the the you know the more uh, draconian uh, reinforcement from any sovereign problems being transferred to the banking sector, and of course banking sectors being ultimately a, a sovereign problem as well. That, 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 that is a concern that um, is so it's, it's So it sounds to me like you would be very much in favor of more transparency as a way to reduce that uncertainty. I mean, obviously the transparency in the, in the short run could be bad for some and not so bad for others, but it sounds like you think uh, more transparency would be helpful. Any ideas on how to go, you know, push that forward? So look, I, I, I think, more balance sheet transparency is, is critical at the sovereign level, uh, at the institutional level for financial institutions. So um, I think, you know, um, on the, uh, so at the sovereign level, uh, you know, there are three, sort of relatively uh, problematic areas in terms of imperfect, well, that is always imperfect, but you know, the issue of hidden debts is, is been a recurring one through the ages in financial crisis. It's during a financial crisis, as, as you say, you know, when you, when you introduce transparency, you may find out things that you don't like. 
but I would rather find them uh, before a crisis hits than find out at the height of the crisis that, you know, there's all these hidden debt problems, you know, and, and examples of those hidden debts, you know, have not been lacking. I mean, to mention a couple, you know, in the, during the, uh, you know, Greek crisis, of course, you know, the government accounts have been fudged. So public debt turned out to be a lot higher. Um, during uh, the Asian crisis, um, you know, it was thought that both Thailand and Korean central banks had much higher reserve levels. In effect, they had contracted debts that, you know, in the, in the future forward market that uh, made net reserves uh, much lower. Th those kinds of negative surprises. Uh, and I think there are three areas that right now where transparency can be uh, improved. I actually, at the bank, you know, the, the group that I'm, uh, um, you know, one of the groups that, that um, is, is under my, my uh, 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 the, the departmental oversight is, uh, does the international debt statistics. And there, you know, there are three broad areas where it's, you know, and, and there's success is not yes, no, it's, it's shades of, you know, it's incremental. Um, you know, often we have very good idea what central government's debts are, but in many, in, in more than half, according to a recent survey that, that we conducted, more than half of, of emerging markets in developing countries don't have consolidated uh, fiscal accounts. So you don't know what the state-owned enterprises borrow, or you know only a fraction. So we've been beefing up uh, data gathering for state-owned enterprises. Um, the other area that is newer uh, in the international architecture is, and I alluded to this earlier, the large wave of lending from China to many uh, emerging markets in low income countries. Much of that uh, is off the radar screen. I did, uh, you know, I did research with Sebastian Horn and Christoph Trebisch on the hidden debt problem. Um, you know, so, so again, we're making headways trying to uh, uncover that. Uh, a third and last source of, of, you know, where more transparency is also needed is domestic debt. You know, look, back in the 1980s crisis, uh, the whole issue for emerging markets and developing countries was external debt, uh, domestic debt markets, inflation in the 70s had pretty much wiped clean those that had domestic markets and indeed some of the emerging markets never had had domestic, uh, significant domestic debt markets. But so it was a simpler environment. It was, you know, specifically US commercial banks and some other European banks had, you know, over length and so on. Now we also, not only have the complicated external landscape with bondholders, all kinds of private creditors, uh, the classic official lenders and the newer official lenders, um, you know, the, the non-Paris club uh, um, lenders, and we have domestic debt. Um, where, you know, what's considered domestic debt, you know, the issue of domestic arrears, uh, you know, countries where, and this is a big issue, Bill, during the pandemic, you know, local governments or, you know, um, federal governments that are facing revenue shortfalls and start to delay payments to suppliers. And so mm -hmm. the, the, we could go on for hours talking about the transparency issue. It is very important to get a handle on the scale of, of 
of the problem you're facing. You've got let to know me, what me, kind of problem you're tackling. So let me uh, switch gears before we open up to, uh, to the audience for questions. So World Bank, IMF, do you guys have sufficient resources to do your job? Do you have the right tool set to do your job? What, you know, if, what's on your wish list? <laughs> what, look, what, what, what you'd it, like it, that you don't have? <laughs> uh, look, it, it depends. Bill, and it really depends on how you define doing your job. I mean, you know, uh, both for the, less so I'd say for the bank and more for the IMF, the, the mandate over time has evolved, okay? Um, you know, um, I, I actually did a piece with Christoph Trebisch some years ago on, you know, uh, seven, the first 70 years of the IMF. And, you know, the, the lending of the 50s and 60s and into the 1980s debt crisis was really balance of payment support. Uh, so, you know, you, and balance of payment support is temporary. Uh, it doesn't deal with the more structural problems, you know, the kinds of debt challenges that we're also uh, talking about. Um, and so, you know, for balance of payment support um, with a much shorter pipeline, uh, one would say that you know, the IMF has enough resources, you know. Now, I, what the IMF, the World Bank, and all the multilaterals combined do not have enough resources for if they really wanted to act as a lender of last resort during crisis. Because the capacity, in the end, the capacity to create, I mean, yes, we've had the expansion of the SDR, you know, we've, we are going through a replenishment for, for IDA at the bank. So yes, resources are replenished, but it can't do what the Fed did in the middle of an emergency. It can't say, you know, I mean, it tried to very close to do that given existing resources. Uh, so, you know, it, the, the, uh, I think both the bank and the fund and other multilaterals shifted gears very quickly to, to a lot more front loading, you know, much quicker disbursement, uh, much more emergency type lending than any time in the past. Um, and so, you know, uh, I think can can, uh, so, so I, I, I view that as, as you know, a, a success in, 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 you know, dealing with, with, a, with a global pandemic. Um, I think an area where, you know, thankfully, you know, the Fed came in and, and, and literally saved the day at, 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 at you know, but if, at the height of the pandemic, when, you know, in the spring of last year, when emerging market sovereign bond prices were collapsing, you know, the Fed created stabilization funds. The ECB created stabilization funds to help, you know, local governments, to help corporates. But the night, no, multilateral had the capacity, the resources to do any kind of stabilization, even though at that time, uh, initial conditions being what they were, and, but clearly the aggregates were falling because of this. So, so it, I'm not overcomplicating things, but I think the question you pose is a very difficult one because I think they have, you know, enough resources to do a lot. Um, the day-to-day, the day-to-day -day, -day things. <laughs> but, but, you know, relative to a, a, relative to a true global central bank or not. Yeah, well, I think you hit the nail on the head. The fact that the facilities can't be open-ended in size means there's always the question, is, is it going to be big enough 
Exactly. And if, it, and if people worry that, about it being big enough, then you don't get the confidence enhancing properties that you get when something's truly uh, open ended. So I think you it's not. It it, it 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 sets up the stage for runs. It, yeah, it, exactly. I mean, the other thing you could do is try to make something that's a little bit more powerful. So ex ante, so that people understood that if you entered a very bad period, here's what was going to happen. And the results would be very front loaded and powerful. That could also be, I, I guess, helpful. Uh, well, unfortunately, we've, we've exhausted our time of chat chatting. So I want to uh, move on to the uh, our audience and, and let them ask you some questions as well. So I'm going to turn the floor back to Emily Slater to uh, pose some questions. Emily? Well, thank, yeah, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, covered a lot of ground from the 1930s until now. Um, I'm first going to go to Bill Rhodes, who ha knows a thing or two about the 1980s crisis, and he's also leading our sovereign debt work um, and is also vice chair of our board. So, Bill, you want to go ahead and pose your question? Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Carmen, for a tour de force uh, on sovereign debt from the 1930s on. <clears throat> um, as you point out, uh, the difference from the 1980s is, uh, you know, the Brady Plan took us out, securitized the debt. Uh, you didn't have one belt, one road. China wasn't there. Uh, and so there are some significant uh, uh, differences uh, that, uh, that we see. But uh, as Emily mentioned, uh, we are working on a series of papers uh, covering the sovereign debt problem. Uh, and hopefully you've had a chance to, because we sent it to you to see our initial one. Uh, and you and Bill have covered transparency, which is what we're working on now uh, with a lot of, uh, I think, uh, good commentary. And the next one is the private sector. But we would welcome any thoughts that you have on, on these subjects, given your vast experience and your writing. So please do not hesitate to give us any thoughts that you might have, because we would welcome them tremendously. Second of all, I guess my final point is uh, during the 1980s, uh, <clears throat> since I led most of these bank uh, agreement arrangements, I worked with Ernie Stern, who was then uh, at the World Bank <clears throat> as, uh, as vice president. And we came up with a number of ways that the World Bank could actually work on these areas, whether it be co-financing, uh, their support of the Brady Plan. And you might just want to comment on what kind of role you see in addition to what the World Bank is doing now that could help, uh, you know, ameliorate uh, this difficult situation, which you did such a great job of describing. Thank you very much. And we're also happy that you took this job and you were in that role. Well, th th thank you, Bill. And, and I do look forward very much to continuing our, our discussions also on, on your ongoing work, which is both of great interest and, and, and great importance uh, at the current conjuncture. Uh, uh, because <laughs> one thing about that crisis is they're not short lived. Uh, you know, that it, it, the resolution uh, uh, does take time. Um, you know, from beginning to end, if you look at the big historical uh, picture, um, from beginning to end, the average duration of, of a debt, debt problem resolution. And, and I'm not saying this gratuitously, I'm going, Bill, to the question you pose, but uh, it, it, because the duration is, it's, it's between seven and eight years and often characterized by repeated restructurings. You do a restructuring, Maybe the restructuring offers some cash flow relief. Maybe it offers a maturity extension, but somehow the debt reduction isn't big enough to solve the debt sustainability problem. That is the norm. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I'm going directly to, to the question of, you know, uh, what can be expected and also what the bank can 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 contribute to. Um, so, you know, uh, the repeated restructurings uh, arise for understandable reasons that creditors, whether they're official or private, whether they're commercial banks or bondholders, nobody wants to take a big haircut right off the bat. 
and, and, and I don't expect this you know, crisis going forward to be any different on that regard from, from the, the biggest Latin American crisis of the 19th century, which occurred you know, in the 1820s. Um, so, so that is the starting point. So there is the issue of how to get, and this is where I also the multilaterals and the World Bank, and you know the the, the issue of getting uh, the private creditors involved often also, you know, involves carrots and involves sticks. You know, it involves both. Um, on the carrot side, uh, you know. I think uh, part of the story usually involves, uh, you know, trying to work out a joint program with the IMF and provide enough new funding, you know, new new flow, uh, so that the country can navigate and, you know, um, in connection with with debt reduction, half debt sustainability restored. So that providing new financing is 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 part of the uh, part of the usual package, right? You you get some haircuts. The IMF and the world and the multilaterals, the World Bank and the multilaterals provide new financing, and you try to navigate and hope that that program works out. Uh, the other, th the other thing, of course, and this might be very important also for climate finance uh, and climate objectives, because many of these countries are also ha have, you know, die. I don't want to, you know, because that is a topic right on its own. But uh, you know, in addition to all the financing needs, there are also uh, financing uh, associated with what is expected to take place for, for bringing the climate agenda forward, uh, sweeteners, uh, you know, uh, the, the bank in the past has uh, the IMF on a more limited basis, but offered certain amount of guarantees, right? That, um, you know, brings in, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it acts as a catalyst, uh, you know, the guarantee acts as a catalyst to, to, to private capital coming into, uh, you know, um, places where it might not have gone otherwise. Uh, the third area that it does is, you know, where, where the bank could also, um, play a role is, of course, uh, if, you know, on a grander scale, there is a much more orchestrated uh, debt reduction plan, like the Brady, or like later on the HIPIC, the Highly Indebted Poorest Country Initiative. But I will say this, I wouldn't hold my breath for either a Brady or a Hippic anytime soon. Because if you look, and I don't need to tell you this, Bill, you know, if you look at the trajectory, it took a long time to get there, right? I mean, Mexico's default was August of 1982. And, you know, we, we tried a lot of stuff before we got to, to the Brady and even longer, the Hippic was, was in 2006. Um, so, but I think on the, on the uh, new lending slash uh, guarantees, those are part of what what the bank, you know, what the bank does. Thank you, Carmen. I want to now pass it over to Paul Sheard, who has a question. Paul, if you could go ahead and pose your question. Thanks very much, Emily. Thanks very much, Carmen. Um, you know, I wondered if you could just uh, talk a little bit about how closely the World Bank is coordinating its programs with uh, you know, the IMF, the WHO, other international organizations, and whether this uh, degree of, of coordination and joint programs has increased 
during the pandemic and then perhaps looking to the future, whether there's um, you know, lessons to be learned uh, for the future in terms of that kind of all hands on deck approach to solving these global challenges? Well, you know, I think um, the World Bank and the IMF have a very long history of coordination. Um, you know, the mandates of the two institutions, of course, you know, are, are different. Um, so the bank's involvement and coordination with the IMF is greater for the low-income countries than for the middle-income countries, for example. Um, part of the, you know, in response to Bill's question, you know, part of providing more finance and, you know, a joint in the context of, say, a debt reduction program, uh, you know, part of that coordination is, is starts out, you know, with the nuts and bolts of, of doing a debt sustainability analysis for, low, you know, whatever. And that debt sustainability exercise is done jointly by the IMF and the, and the World Bank for the low income countries, okay? Uh, and that debt sustainability analysis sets the stage for, you know, uh, in the cases, only in the cases where, you know, there's a, a debt crisis and, 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 and the debt is deemed unsustainable. Um, you know, uh, in those cases, it sets a stage for, you know, creditor committees like what we are uh, at the moment seeing creditors committee discussing Chad, for example, which applied for, or, you know, one of the first countries to apply for the common framework. Um, and that's just start, you know, standard, Paul, of the way that two institutions work, um, you know, in any uh, program discussion, even if it's not, you know, a high risk or a debt distress case. And it, there, you know, the IMF, uh, the IMF um, uh, programs, also factor in financing, you know, the, the, these programs project how much financing is needed and how much of it is gonna come from the World Bank or from other multilaterals. Um, so I would just describe that as really part of the, you know, the working of the machinery and that's continuing. I, I don't think that that has changed the scale of it, increased dramatically, right? Because the scale of lending by these institutions increased and in the number of programs and so on. So the scale increased significantly during COVID, but the nature of what it's been doing, I don't, it's not my sense that it's changed in any dramatic way. I don't know if that gets to your question, Paul. I think you've sufficiently answered it, Carmen. Thank okay. you. Why don't we wrap up with one final question? Um, we have a question from Mahesh Kotecha and Mahesh, I'll ask you to be brief. He is um, has questions about the DSSI and common framework. I think we've covered the private sector piece of that. So Mahesh, okay. do you wanna go ahead? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, 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 I'm so glad to see uh, Dr. Reinhardt at the World Bank and such a, a astute observer of the history. Uh, my question is related to the time lags that you mentioned that it took before uh, the uh, Brady plan and before HIPIC were implemented. How long you think we're gonna suffer the pain this time, considering that the degree of uh, poverty increase that is unprecedented. Well, I, I don't know if it's unprecedented, but certainly first time since the nineties that you mentioned is imposing huge pain uh, around the world, which is almost out of sight of the developed countries uh, with the vaccinations, 
levels in Nigeria, for example, not around 2% or less. So this problem is a, is a slow moving train wreck. Is there anything you can do to accelerate the resolution to, to provide something like Yellen bonds or something similar that clones the Brady bond proposal and solution actually? Uh, Mahesh, this is a topic that gets discussed again and again and again um, uh, because of its critical importance, because right timing in this. Uh, what can be done to speed things up? Um, so as the pandemic uh, discussions at the G20 got underway, the common framework was born. Uh, the common framework is promising, and I, I, I'm, I'm being quite candid on what I think will work or not work. It's quite promising in that it is the first time that it tries to bring in also the newer creditors, newer big creditors, China, India, Saudi Arabia, into the, uh, the, the discussion uh, and the process of debt reduction. So the big trial balloon right now, I alluded to Chad earlier. This is, this is the, right now, it's, there are three countries that have applied and this is very relevant because I think, I, I worry, Mahesh, that this is also going to be very slow moving train as you put it. Uh, the best shot or a, you know, an encouraging, step towards speeding the process up is if ideally all three of the countries, but even two out of the three countries that applied for the common framework, these are uh, uh, Chad, Zambia and Ethiopia, that these cases move quickly to a significant debt reduction, right? Uh, and I, I, I've used two words, quickly and significant. If you move quickly to a new debt restructuring that is shallow, that's not gonna resolve the debt overhang. That means we'll be restructuring again, you know, a year and a half from now. Okay, um, if you get significant, but it takes you three years, four years, or even longer to get there, that, that is the, the, the train wreck that, that you've alluded to in, in your, your question, and, and it was all too prevalent in the 1980s. A critical problem is... Um, and this does not unrelate, it's not unrelated to the issue I discussed with uh, Bill moments ago also on transparency, obviously is not the only issue, but right now there's a great deal of distrust among creditors. Great deal of distrust, you know, that uh, do we know whether, you know, I, the, there's issues, you know, in Chad, the case of, of obviously collateralized debt is a big problem. Uh, issues of seniority, issues of full disclosure. Um, are, you know, are hurdles to quick resolution. So to conclude on, on your question is, I am not expecting a swift exit. Um, I think it will be a very positive signal if the common framework delivers swift and significant action on at least two out of these three countries. That's a good first step. But I am not uh, optimistic for the classic timeless reasons. Predators, understandably, don't want to take losses. Uh, so uh, it's not very uplifting, but you know, it is my honest assessment. 
Thank you, Carmen, for your honesty. You've sure given our Sovereign Debt Working Group a lot of food for thought for our upcoming papers. So very much appreciate you being with us today. You've been very generous with your time. Uh, we have run out of time, so I want to wrap it up here. Thanks again to Dr. Reinhardt. Thank you, Bill Dudley, for moderating our conversation. And thank you to our audience uh, for attending today. Uh, and that'll conclude today's discussion. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Bye. Great to talk. That was fun. <laughs>